Axel Carrera. Axel, thank you so much for being here. It's such a pleasure to be able to interview you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, you know how much I admire your work. And for us in REC, La Red de Estudios Críticos Latinoamericanos, it's really a pleasure to be able to introduce you to new readers so that more people get to know your work. Thank you. It's a pleasure. So what we're going to do now is just like basically get to know a little bit why did you get into philosophy in the first place? What is philosophy for you? Yesterday you were saying something about naming people, thinkers, as philosophers, as a subversive way of reinscribing what philosophy really is and what philosophy has left outside, right? So uh, we are very curious about how is it that you got into this discipline? Um, what led you to ask the kind of questions you have been asking already for a while, and how, has, how that trajectory has been so far. So why don't we start with you telling us a little bit of how did you get to philosophy in the first place? Yeah, uh, I, I, I guess I, I, I got into philosophy through the back door. Mm -hmm. um, like many uh, black philosophers, especially black women philosophers. Mm -hmm. The trajectory is not a traditional one mm -hmm. uh, for a number of us. Uh, I don't know how many, I think that a total graduate student included, I don't think we're more than 60 in the world. So the community is really small and most of us have uh, uh, have a kind of like a, a non-traditional uh, uh, route into, mm -hmm. into the discipline. In my case, I was actually, I was born in Rwanda, mm -hmm. and uh, I, um, I, I, I'm a, a genocide survivor, and um, so when I started, I started uh, my undergraduate uh, uh, education uh, later than the usual 18 year old. So I, I started, uh, I worked for a very long time, mm -hmm. um, uh, and, um, I mean, I got into, I, 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 I arrived in, uh, in Canada as a refugee in early 2000 and I worked for a little while before I went, I was able to go back to school and I also was a francophone so I had to learn English so the, the, uh, uh, so I took the time to actually just basically feel comfortable in, in being able to pursue uh, an education in English. Uh, so, but, my, I had a I had an image of what I wanted to do and what I wanted to be, and part of that idea was uh, obviously a result of my own biographical um, uh, condition, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. and so I wanted to be a, a, a psychologist. So, but I had this like really rather uh, old notion of what psychology was uh, because I was. I had been educated in the European system uh, since I was a child, and the psychology was Freud. You know, I thought mm -hmm. that psychology was Lacan, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, very early on, I realized that that was not psychology. That that was basically <laughs> philosophy, exactly. <laughs> so uh, I barely read any Freud, and I was very frustrated by the kind of biological paradigm and the behavioral uh, uh, kind of like the the behavioral science. Uh, uh, kind of like hijacking of of the field, and uh, very early on, I realized that you know um, because of my own um, uh, experience, uh, this idea that human behavior was actually or human existence was calculable yeah. for me was just completely absurd. Yeah. But um, uh, as you know, the psychology degree is a very difficult one for some, for some uh, reason. So I had done two years of coursework and and um, it just, like I'm not a quitter. So mm -hmm. I was like, mm -hmm. I am going to finish this, yeah. even if I just realized that, that it's obviously not for me. Yeah. So while I was studying, I was trying to figure out what could actually what kind of tool were available for me to make sense of my own experience yeah. uh, in a non-reductive way. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so I took an existentialism class, very classic story, uh, and you know, I read Nietzsche and I was like, oh, wait a second, this is, this is exactly what, um, 
what I needed. Mm -hmm. and, and then I took more philosophy classes and in the Canadian, I think uh, it's also the same uh, in some schools here, but in the Canadian, at least in my school, I went to York University in Toronto, mm -hmm. uh, there were no requirements, like no rigid requirements to mm -hmm. have a philosophy degree. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just basically kept taking classes. And also, although uh, the, the, uh, the, the training of the program was uh, heavily analytic, mm -hmm. there were a few, I also realized that I couldn't do analytic philosophy. Mm -hmm. I also had the same frustration that I had in psychology. Yeah. So I gravitated toward all the, the um, the continental uh, courses. Mm -hmm. So I took a class in existentialism, and then um, I had to write a thesis in psychology, mm -hmm. and uh, that was a challenge because I was like, "Well, what, what am I going to write about?" Yeah. Uh, and then I took a class on the history of psychology, and all of a sudden I just kind of like got the the bug of kind of a historian of ideas. And, um, and it, I wrote a, a, a thesis on the history of race and racism in, in, in the discipline of psychology. Okay. And so that was sort of my entry in questions about race. Um, and because uh, my own experiences were so intric intricately uh, linked to questions of race, yeah. um, but also uh, different experiences of race, um, as you know, race on the, uh, on in the African uh, context, race in Europe, uh, race in North America. As an immigrant in Canada, and yeah. then back afterwards coming to the United States, I imagine every yeah. single experience is very different. In yeah, different yeah, ways. absolutely. But it was in Canada that I realized that I wanted to to understand uh, the the concept of race, and I wanted to study uh, race and racism. And, and I didn't, obviously, didn't want to do it in psychology. Mm -hmm. And so I asked one of my, 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 my mentor at the time, mm -hmm. uh, her name is Alice McLe uh, McLe uh, McLaughlin, mm -hmm. and um, she had been teaching a course in, uh, on forgiveness and retribution. Mm -hmm. And we had read some events and some Derrida, although she's analytically grounded. Mm -hmm. um, so she brought in the analytic tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, she taught a little bit of some of the, the figure that I went on to study a bit more. And, um, and then one day she said, well, Axel, if you really want to study race from a philosophical point of view, you can't stay in Canada. Yeah. There's no one for you to work with. Mm -hmm. You are going to have to have a friend a, um, a program in the United States. And, uh, and then there was this thing called Pixie. She's like, oh, you know, there's this thing called Pixie. Um, I, uh, some of my teachers are, are uh, directing this program. I think you, 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 you would be a good fit. I think you should definitely um, apply. I applied. Uh, Marina Ortega was actually the person who made my application. Nice. And uh, she still speaks about it. It's kind of like slightly <laughs> emotional. Uh, and uh, she... And so I, I was admitted part, I was one of the 12 students, the early, early Pixley. Yeah. And then when I was at Pixley, you know, long story short, Robert was there. Uh, Robert wasn't there, Robert Berlusconi wasn't there, but he heard about me. Mm -hmm. And he actually came to Toronto mm -hmm. um, to recruit me. Oh, wow. And so, so I, I really, I, it, it had never, I had never really thought about studying philosophy. Yeah. And it was at that moment, uh, when I took this this class in forgiveness, uh, that I thought, oh, maybe this could be a possibility. But where do I do this? Like I had no idea. Yeah. I was completely, I was uh, uninformed. I had, I was, I, you know, I was a foreigner. I had no yeah. idea how things worked. And and so when I, uh, Robert came to to Toronto, um, he convinced me this is what we should do, and you should apply here. And yeah, and the rest is kind of like history. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. yeah, it's a long, long history yeah. of how you got into philosophy. Yeah. But I mean, it also tells a lot about what philosophy is and how the landscape has been changing recently, I would say. Yeah. I'm curious about how you feel about that, whether you feel 
I mean, from my perspective, you belong to a new generation of thinkers who are really changing radically the landscape of the discipline. Yeah. And this was made possible, of course, by institutions like Pixie yeah. or by an institution like Robert Bernasconi so, yeah. himself. He is a great right? institution himself. Yes. <laughs> but there is also this new, I don't know, air mm -hmm. that is really radically subverting yeah. and using the tools of philosophy to really rethink what philosophy is. How yeah. do you feel in connection to that, um, let's say, change of landscape of the discipline? Uh -huh. Are you optimistic about it? Yes and no. Um, uh, I'll start with a no. Um, I think that um, I think that the things that we have to deal with in philosophy mm -hmm. are things that not a lot of disciplines, things that people working in different disciplines have that have had to deal with, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 years ago. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And by that I mean that the gatekeepers mm -hmm. of, of professional philosophy mm -hmm. are very powerful mm -hmm. uh, and, and I don't underestimate them. Yeah. Uh, I think they have an incredible amount of, of uh, drive mm -hmm. in keeping, in sanitizing mm -hmm. the discipline or whatever the idea of philosophy the they have yeah. or what, whatever the idea of discipline they have. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't underestimate it. They, they, not a lot of things scare me, but they're part of the people that actually scare me about the future of philosophy. Mm -hmm. I don't think they will let go mm -hmm. anytime soon. Mm -hmm. um, I think that they, their power extends to my own generation in the sense that they have trained. Uh, mostly white men mm -hmm. who are carrying out the gatekeeping practices, they know how to do it. Yeah. Um, and they're shameless in a sense that I think that people in English or in anthropology or in psychology even or in sociology, yeah, there's, a, yeah, yeah. there's a certain kind of a level of, of, uh, of, of shame, shame where they're like, okay, I actually can't do this. Yeah. At least they have um, to do it superstitiously. Exactly, not, yeah. exactly. I mean, I can give you an example. For instance, um, I won't name the person, but I did have a, a one day a conversation with a prominent old white philosopher, men, a man, and um, we were discussing uh, the collegium. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess a really, uh, it was just like a really kind of like innocuous comment about the possibility of having a colleague in one year uh, dedicated to the philosophy of race. Yeah. And I thought that I had insulted him. He turned to me and said, never. That will wow. never happen. I mean, I'm one of the speaker at Caligian, uh next year, so yeah. I'm sorry. I yes. mean, things are happening. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that's the, 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 the yes part, in the sense that I think that there are a generation of, of um, tenured and uh, obviously um, senior professors yeah. who are allies and who are willing to um, who are willing to actually have a different vision, or at least to to try to open up. Yeah, uh, their idea of what philosophy is. I, I think. I mean, you know, uh, the director this year of Collegium Anglo Burn, I think, yeah. uh, is one of them. As she's, mm -hmm. you can see who are who are on the on the program this year. Yes. It's a very different yeah. Collegium. But Collegium is one of those, you know, huge uh, comment of philosophy esta establishment, and yeah. you see all these people there yeah. uh, next year. It's 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 refreshing, and um, I don't know. It's, it gives me a little bit of hope. Um, and the other thing, and the reason why, well, the other hope is, is to see what, obviously, Robert is, is incredibly, uh, is just incredible uh, with what he has been able to do along the years. Yes. Uh, 
but is to see what his students are doing. And I think that, you know, uh, Rob is a very uh, selfless person. Mm -hmm. He's, he's uh, you would think he'll be extremely narcissistic and egoistic. He's actually not. Yes. And, and oftentimes he says, well, it's really about the students. Yeah. I think he takes, uh, I think for him, the real work is to see people like myself or others, uh, like, um, I don't know, there's so many, uh, Desiree Valentine and, and Marquette, Kim Harris and Marquette as well. Um, uh, there's just a number of young, uh, Lindsay Stewart at, at, in Memphis. There's just a young generation who are actually um, thriving yeah. um, in a very difficult uh, discipline, but they're nevertheless thriving. Yeah. And, and we are pushing things and we are kind of like talking back to, uh, it's like super cliche to say, <laughs> but we are talking back to power, I yeah, think. Yeah, and, I, and I think that it's, it's working. And uh, one of the things that we've been able to do is to, um, is precisely to subvert the canon in yeah. the sense that we are acknowledging the philosophical work that's been done outside of the field of philosophy yeah. and you are pushing to incorporate exactly. these voices as a philosophical canon in yes. philosophy of race. Yes. So I think that there's definitely a lot of things happening and um, and it's, I mean, even this workshop yes. uh, uh, here in uh, Northwestern mm -hmm. uh, is also a testament to the possibilities that uh, we currently have and, uh, and the possibility of an open future uh, yes. in the field. For philosophy. Yeah. I mean, from my perspective, it's always just a question of survival. How is philosophy as a discipline going to survive or whether is it going to become obsolete? Oh. And either the landscape of the discipline changes and then the discipline gets to survive and deserves to survive, or it just will have to die and become something completely yeah. different because of it. Yeah. But thinking about precisely this idea of subverting the canon, um, why don't you tell us a little bit too about what you did with your dissertation because that was precisely something that you wanted to do. Let's mm -hmm. reread Fanon mm -hmm. and reread him. And now that I know you come from psychology, which I have no idea, <laughs> it makes even more sense to me that you want to rescue Fanon from a sort of clinical, like neutralizing form of reading him. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what happened there? Um, so it's it's sort of like the same thing. Uh, it's just being. Uh, 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 I wasn't just not satisfied with. I read Fanon, mm -hmm. and all I could, I, I could, everything that I read. I mean, he for me, I thought that he was basically just telling me my like narrating my life, mm -hmm. right? uh, everything from black skin, white mask. Uh, to the region of the earth, there are like, for instance, there are these pages where I just see my father the whole time. Yeah. Uh, and I just, it, I just thought that we just couldn't bury him in pious and stale readings. Mm -hmm. um, but funny enough, I, there was there was another uh, there there are different kind of readings of Fanon that were very much uh, um, in line with my own attempts mm -hmm. at rescuing him through a different lens mm -hmm. uh, that I actually didn't know about, mm -hmm. that I discovered after my, my, my uh, dissertation, like for instance, to work with David Merritt. Mm -hmm. I, thought, I thought to myself, if I had known David Merritt, who was reading at the time when I was writing my dissertation, again, just to, to show you what can happen to, to thought. Yeah. Uh, in philosophy, yeah. uh, how how you can be isolated, yes. and uh, and you know, there's a I, I talk about the philosophical canon, the kind of like traditional philosophy canon, but the same thing is uh, goes for philosophy of race. Yeah, we had a canon, and uh, only certain people were being read. Exactly, only certain people were being read. Only, only certain people were kind of like the legitimate voice of philosophy of, of race of philosophy of race. 
and they're also afraid right now. You can see that they have the same kind of gay, territorial gay, yeah, uh, the gatekeeping practices than that white men have. Yeah, uh, it's it, it's really fascinating to see. Yeah, uh, right now, but so I was. Uh, the kind of like the existential and phenomenological final was just not ringing mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. And I had been studying Der uh, Derrida and Deleuze with, um, with Len Noller. And there was just this dimension of their work for me, which I found in, uh, like, I, I, I sort of like I found like a prototype of it mm -hmm. in the work of Fano. I thought that Fano was doing this yeah. much earlier mm -hmm. uh, than they were. Mm -hmm. So that's and coming from a different place, exactly. which is so important. Exactly. So that's sort of like the, that's, it was just like really an experiment. Mm -hmm. But an experiment that actually uh, happened to be uh, coherent in a sense. Uh, because a year later, I, I found the work of, of, uh, uh, of David Merritt and uh, and Fred Mo and, and others, and I was like, wait a second, I was not crazy. And you yeah. see, if I wasn't in philosophy, I would have known these spheres, yes, right? Yes, so, yes. so this is what I've been doing. Mm -hmm. uh, like for instance, David Merritt is coming to my department next week, mm -hmm. so I've been like really pushing to incorporate this like uh, philosophical work in in, in, in cr with what now I'm calling critical black studies, but I I I, I'm, I also have begun to use the, the term critical black black philosophy yeah. um, as, um, as kind of like a, um, a term of precision because I think critical philosophy race incorporated a, a very um, uh, 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 how would I say it? I mean, there are, there are many voices yeah. in, uh, in, in, in critical philosophy race. The, the Latinx voice, there's uh, the Asian voice and and so on. So, so but there is something about the black radical tradition uh, that is specifically about a philosophical approach to black existence. Yeah. Um, and and these voices were, you know. We, we had never heard of them. Yes. Um, yeah. So, so forcing philosophy. So now forcing philosophy. To opening its ears to exactly. this kind of thinking, yeah. but also forcing this thinking to be heard as philosophy. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I mean, now if you if you go to Penn State and you ask uh, black students what they are studying, yeah, they're writing dissertation on on Cynthia Hartman yes. and, and Spillers and, and Marriott. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is the kind of work that they're doing yeah. and and the and to see how that's transforming the field, yeah. it's really, really exciting yeah. and and quite hopeful. Hopeful and powerful. Yeah. And I mean every time I hear you speaking I say like of course, this is the future of philosophy, nothing but this. So I think, I mean, I remain optimistic because of people like you in the discipline itself. Oh, thank you so much <laughs> coming from you. No. So before, before we, we end, I do want to get from your project on Fanon to your current project, because I'm very interested in the relationships between the two and how do you see the relevance of your new project in connection to that trajectory that you just told us about. Uh -huh. Okay, so there, um, it would be difficult uh, with the time that we have here to actually yeah. make like uh, clear connections between both both works. Mm -hmm. I actually um, I put Fanon on pause for mm -hmm. a second mm -hmm. uh, because it needed some sort of like distance to to my work, and also because I had discovered this new. Uh, these new readers of Fano, mm -hmm. which who echoed my own approach, mm -hmm. and I wanted to give myself time to actually really dive into to digest this to digest, whole um, secondary yeah. literature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and also needed the time to distance myself to all the bad reading of Fano, which mm -hmm. I, just, I call bad reading. Mm -hmm. I know uh, people hate me for this, but yeah, <laughs> so, or rather, kind of like um, slightly archaic reading. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to to uh, um, take some time away from that. And mm -hmm. then 
I really this new project was uh, was uh, uh, kind of like uh, again you don't know how you encounter these things. I was invited to a workshop in Johannesburg on the question of uh, cl climate change, mm -hmm. and frankly. Uh, I was invited because I was part of the of the Critical Philosophy Race Initiative at Penn mm -hmm. State. Mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about climate change. Nothing. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't tell you anything. Mm -hmm. But I knew I had to go to this workshop yeah. in a year time. Yeah. So one summer, I remember it was in the hot Atlanta. I read from six in the morning to six p.m. for like four or five months. Yeah. Uh, and I was lucky enough, I had a, a fellowship at the time I was in teaching. Mm -hmm. It was my first fellowship in, at FAU mm -hmm. in Florida. And my partner lives in, in, in Atlanta, so I, I was going back to That's Florida. Important. So I remember these like, really hot days where I was like, what is this thing called? What is this Anthropocene thing? Yes, yes. So I started reading all these um, uh, mostly white women. Mm -hmm. And then the frustration. Yes. Day after day, I was so frustrated. Mm -hmm. And I was so inspired by my frustration. Yeah. And it was kind of like the same thing that happened to me with Fano. I was so inspired by my frustration. I was like, something has to be done. Something is missing here. Yeah. That is not just missing, it would be fundamental. Yes. You have to change the entire framework that we're using to address this question. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And for me, also, the frustration was to actually see this rather problematic reading of this question of the Anthropocene that were regarded as kind of like cutting edge, critical, radical, critical theory. Yeah. And it was like there's nothing radical about this, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that's how I ended up in the, with this new project. Yeah. And where I'm going with it, I mean, um, it's precisely to identify the kind of like the crucial, the central uh, uh, term, kind of concept, right? Yeah. And, and force a kind of like history, a conceptual history, yeah. and interrogate the investments into these concepts. Like mm -hmm. for instance, I, I did that with the question of relationality yes. uh, yesterday. And my, 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 this first project is presented just about relationality. Okay. But, you know, one can say oh, a number of things, you know, um, I've, I, I, I want to just talk about relationality in this first book, but it seems to me that I would have to also to talk about the post-human. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm really trying to force kind of a genealogy of these concepts, mm -hmm. an honest genealogy of yes. these concepts, mm -hmm. right? And, 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 and uh, understand why the commitment, why the investment, and what kind of sciences and erasure make these commitment coherent, yeah. right? make uh, these investments even possible. Mm -hmm. And one of them uh, I identify as basically the erasure of race, and, and, and particularly uh, the kind of like, the violent silences around the question of blackness. Yeah. yeah. And what I heard about, I mean, you were presenting he here yesterday at the Western workshop also, what I thought was very interesting was, it's not just about the silencing, it's also about the fact that that silencing is constitutive Absolutely. of what makes possible even the speech as it is being uh, articulated. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's the critical theory part of it, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's like making us think about what are the new frameworks that we need to produce in order to really think about the problem differently, which is what I think is so powerful about the project too. Yeah. It could go in many directions, mm -hmm. but what you're pointing to already is this constitutively hiddenness and erasure that is what makes it possible in the first place, that needs to be rethought. Absolutely, and there is, a, uh, there is now like a, a, a growing, uh, growing work around uh, this idea of really studying the the, 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 the structures of logics, of various kind of logics yes. uh, that make, you know, um, you know, it's, it's basically like, you know, uh, the, 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 the move here is to think about what makes these uh, uh, claims possible, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, yeah. And oftentimes we've 
as I've claimed yesterday, and people like Colin Warren, also an ontological terror, claims the, th the same thing. What we actually find at the foundation is a kind of like pervasive foundational violence, right? Yeah. That can only be ignored in order for the the, the logic to to continue to continue, yeah. Yeah, to, to, continue to operate, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so what we're doing as uh, critical black philosophers is precisely to demand philosophy to return to that foundational violence. Yeah. And, ex and, and that exposure of exactly, that foundational absolutely. violence that needs to be exposed, yeah. sadly, yeah. once and again. Right? Absolutely. It's, it's like a ne never ending project. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, some of these works, uh, we kind of like also have conceptual allies, like someone like Derrida, for instance, yeah. um, is, is, uh, is very important to the kind of like conceptual conceptual moves that I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, but yes, yeah, so it's really demanding that we, uh, I mean, we, I, th I think we can, some of us can agree, like even some of the gatekeepers can agree that there's this kind of like inevitable foundational violence yes. uh, to these, uh, to these oper uh, conceptual operation. But to what extent are we ready to actually question that violence? Yeah, exactly. Right. And, and what kind of, kind of violence are we willing to accept and, and see and yeah, hear? Absolutely, yes. absolutely. Well, Axel, thank you so much. Thank this you. has been such a wonderful introduction to your thought. Thank you. And thank you for your time. Thank and you. it's such a wonderful opportunity to sit with you and talk about this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um,